Our next uh, speaker is uh, Jerome Meyer, who is security researcher for Nokia, and he will be talking about the enemy within, securing the broadband edge by mitigating DDoS attacks. Everyone, and uh, indeed we're going to talk about DDoS, so distributed denial of service, uh, and how it is affecting the broadband edge. So in the olden days of DDoS, uh, and it really feels that 2020 was that long ago, uh, bad traffic was mostly, at least the perception was that it was mostly coming from the peering edge, so the service providers were really looking at what's coming in from peering transit, uh, to be able to protect their own infrastructure and to protect their own subscribers and, and, and businesses. So it, this was really more of a, let's say, traditional castle and moat uh, model where you protect your perimeter and uh, mostly what's coming inside uh, and not really looking at what's within. And what we observed, at least in the past couple of years, and you know, this is just one example uh, uh, of uh, smart devices uh, that can uh, really have a, a big impact on, on DDoS and on attack traffic, is that subscribers in service provider networks love IoT devices. Uh, they even love, and this is a bit more recent, uh, with the uh, marketing wars between service providers, they have multi-gigabit uplinks in many cases today. Um, and it turns out that botnet operators also love all those things. So they love those devices, especially those that don't get updated in you know, five years. And a gigabit uplink is a very nice feature for a botnet operator. Now more recently, what we've been starting to observe, um, uh, especially in the past 12 months, is that it turns out that people also love free VPNs uh, for, you know, a bunch of different reasons, but uh, it turns out that there is also no, not a free lunch. And oftentimes those VPN providers uh, have to make money somehow, either by selling off the data to data brokers uh, of the traffic that's transiting through their VPN service, or in many cases, and we are seeing more and more of it today, uh, it, uh, the, the, the actual what's happening is that this VPN uh, apl application is also installing, you know, when you check the box of you know, agreeing to the terms of service. So it is installing a proxy service uh, in the background on the device on which the VPN is running. And that can be used for a variety of uh, reasons, mostly criminals, um, but it's really about you know, uh, using those IP addresses from residential subscribers to uh, do either a variety of activities, like for example, buying sneakers, so this is a major proxy activity, so buying sneakers online, major for, for proxies, uh, but also spam, scam, uh, a bunch of different things. And more recently, we've seen more and more DDoS that is originating from those uh, proxies, uh, so residential proxies, so that, that seem like they are innocuous IP addresses. And this is one example, and I, I won't you know, go into too much detail on this specific example, but there is a very nice uh, blog post from Spur that details, uh, so they, they studied, for example, for this Paladin VPN application, that within minutes of uh, enabling the VPN on their device, uh, their IP address was showing up in this uh, residential proxy provider. So this is something that is really um, so being used at a wide scale. And the funny thing, of course, is that those, I mean, some of those proxy providers uh, claim that those uh, IPs are ethically sourced, which is a nice uh, uh, euphemism. Now, how this ties back into DDoS is that we have been seeing, uh, I think, and especially uh, here in Europe, a lot of increase of some types of DDoS activities um, in the context of the war in Ukraine. And for example, so I, I just put this one example as we've been working with one of our customers to address it. Uh, this is, uh, um, let's say, pro-Russia activist group that has been uh, targeting a variety of different uh, targets, whether from uh, service providers, from uh, government uh, websites. So this is something, and, and of course, you know, they make the headlines because they, result, they, they can result in some outages of availability of websites that are used by you know, uh, consumers. Um, and we, we've seen this again and again for different sites, you know, whether it is airports, government, parliaments, so the, the list goes on and on. And typically, you know, it's not super hard to track this down, I mean, at least in terms of the activity because they operate in the open. 
So you can join their Telegram channel. You can see, okay, this is the list of targets that they have attacked on that day. Um, they do a lot of boasting, of course, because that's expected. Uh, but this is really something that has been you know, ramping up for the past couple of years, and that can have a uh, practical impact uh, on companies and, and subscribers alike. Uh, so this particular group uh, uses, as I mentioned, Telegram to advertise what they do, to also issue th threats uh, on, the, uh, on this group. And uh, the way that they can actually enroll people to join the activity, because it's based on a kind of volunteer basis, so it's not directly uh, nation state backed, but it is something where anyone can join and install the agent that will then launch the traffic uh, to uh, the victims. Um, and they have developed a kind of open source uh, you know, DDoS um, uh, program that will, you know, uh, that will take uh, a list of targets uh, from the command and control center uh, and that will, uh, in a way to motivate people, that will also uh, provide a cryptocurrency payment when people complete successful tasks. And the vector that this uses, so as a, as a primary attack vector, is going to be a web DDoS, so crafted HTTPS request to servers, to websites that they have identified ahead of time. And uh, one of the things that is uh, challenging for, you know, for, for most vendors and you know, for, for the, the affected, um, uh, let's say, targets, is that this is pretty hard to detect. One is, it's not a super high number of sources, so you don't need a lot of, you know, you don't need hundreds of thousands of sources for this attack to succeed in some cases. So it's in the hundreds of uh, source IPs. It's very low, so low and slow type of attack with you know, low BPS, low PPS. Um, what we saw with one of our customers is that the attack was less than 10 megabit per second, and yet it was enough to take the web server down. So this is really something that is not you know, the volumetric DDoS that we have been uh, used to. Uh, it is HTTPS, so TLS encrypted. You, it, you know, it's not really useful to look into the, the payload. It's using valid uh, parameters for the uh, HTTPS request. Uh, so this is, you know, they, they are kind of doing some discovery ahead of time. They are crafting the request so that this will have the maximum impact on the server. And, and this is where it ties back also to the proxy uh, that I was mentioning before. This does not originate from the machines where the volunteers are running the software. So this goes through residential proxies, and this was one of, one of the difficult things also for the targets to mitigate. So one of the methods that uh, the, uh, the victims, or the targets of those attacks have been implementing is geo-blocking, right? And this is, this is often the only uh, solution that many have to, uh, to mit try to mitigate this attack. But geo-blocking really is really far from an optimal solution because by geo-blocking, yes, you will cut off one big part of your traffic, but you will also have, so you will cut off the access from legitimate users outside of your country, uh, and you will also not block anything that is coming from within your country. So high false positive and high false negative rates. And uh, this is especially true for residential proxies because when you look at some of those uh, residential proxy providers, they can source millions of different residential IP addresses. So you have you know, a lot of choices when it comes to selecting exactly which, for example, service provider you want to get your IPs from. Um, so it's not as effective as what it seems. So what we have uh, been doing with uh, some of our customers is really to have to bring uh, some awareness in the traffic about those residential proxy addresses so that we can better detect and then to mitigate, of course, these types of attacks. So the way that um, this works, uh, so with our uh, product, so Deep Field Defender, is that we will uh, get sample data from the IP network that we will then process and correlate with our uh, genome uh, threat intelligence feed. And then so the, uh, the um, let's say the enrichment and the inference of this, um, uh, this model on the network traffic is what we will be using to uh, basically detect that there is an event happening and then to take action based on that uh, data. So what, of course, when we, um, we do this analysis in the customer deployment, uh, we will uh, use the information from genome to understand, for example, who is sending the traffic, what type of traffic is being sent. 
And then once we can we detect the event um, that is happening here, instead of diverting to a scrubber, which would not be generally very effective, especially for this type of attack, what we do is that we will uh, dynamic, dynamically instantiate the access control list entries in the routers, so at the peering edge or elsewhere, and I will come to that, um, to block the attack just by blocking the sources that are sending this specific uh, type of traffic from those residential proxies that are being used at this time. So once we can do that, of course, we can uh, mitigate very effectively whether the IP address is from within the country or from outside. So this is one of the, the nice benefits of doing this and being able to process data uh, in real time on the deployment. And this is something that will, uh, of course, lead to a much better outcome when it comes to false positive, false negative. So we have a much better result with this one as uh, our customers have been able to, to confirm uh, independently. Uh, <clears throat> so now uh, coming back to the, uh, to the edge. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that you know, I mentioned at the beginning is that traditionally it's really been about the peering edge. So what comes inside, uh, what, what comes towards my network. Now with those proxies, with those bots, it is becoming increasingly important to also secure the uh, access edge. Uh, and you know, this is one of the edges of the network that we think is, is really becoming more and more critical also, especially as the uplink speed you know, gets uh, you know, ramped up every year. And um, this is something also that we can do just as well with, uh, you know, we can do it on, on peering, we, we can do it on access edge, and also, for example, on data center edge as well uh, when uh, we get to that. So just to summarize here again, now DDoS is not something that comes you know, strictly just from your peering, uh, so peering on the left here. And then uh, you can, you can see also see that now increasingly you have all those nice devices in red on the, on the right, which are compromised devices, either directly bots or devices where an, uh, you know, uh, a user has been installing this type of VPN apps, which are then installing a proxy backdoor and then being used as part of, of larger attacks. So this is something where you can actually use the same solution to protect both your peering, which is something that is still required today, of course, but also use the same solution and the same type of uh, silicon uh, technology and, and, and really capability to um, protect uh, the, uh, the different edges of the network, including broadband and you know, whether it is wired or, or wireless. So to summarize, um, again, so now, DDoS really also come from subscribers. So this is something where uh, we see both bots, which, which are really still a major source of DDoS today. So more than half of DDoS traffic is coming from bots. For this more specialized application layer type of uh, web DDoS, residential proxies are becoming also a major part of it. So we need to have this uh, you know, capability to block both the volumetric as well as the low and slow type of, of DDoS. And this is something that, we, that really uh, this type of um, uh, you know, big data driven systems like DeepField, of course, uh, can do because we can process this amount of data that is coming from different parts of the network. And this is something that we can process you know, in near real time to be able to formulate what is the best possible mitigation strategy uh, in the different edge of the network. And finally, so one big thing, of course, is that uh, we have been also working really hard to make sure that we can uh, leverage the existing investment into the network because it's always, of course, I mean, a possible answer is always to deploy more hardware. But of course, in our view, it's better to use, to be able to reuse what you have. Um, so being able to leverage the advanced capabilities in silicon that we have today in, in, in modern routers is really something critical. Um, whether and you know whether wherever they are in the network, whether they are on the peering edge or broadband or elsewhere, so we can do this type of surgical mitigation also on the BNGs, for example, uh, when that is required, um, and this is really something that helps both protect, uh, of course, the rest of the internet, which is important, and of course your own infrastructure, because those bots can also be coming from uh, from you know the, uh, the internal infrastructure of the service provider. So with that, uh, I'll end here. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, and uh, I'll be, sorry, in case you'd like to chat some more, I'll be at the Nokia booth over there. Thank you.